vô tư đi khắp thế giới với dịch vụ chuyển vùng quốc tế của Mobifone. Hi, my name is Jonathan Quack, the founder of Financial Intelligence, also known as FYI. Welcome to this edition of Talk Vietnam. Now, quoted by many of the media as Asia's youngest wealth coach, um, Jonathan Quack is our guest today. And he's here uh, with us to share more about how to become a successful investor and also more successful in financing as well. Uh, so do join us in this edition of Talk Vietnam. But before we talk to him more, uh, let's learn more about uh, this um, young man and see how he has been able to become uh, a financial speaker and also entrepreneur, best-selling author that is wanted in many Asian countries. So let's have a look. Jonathan Quick is an exciting entrepreneur, best-selling author, and financial speaker. As an entrepreneur, Jonathan owns and runs several businesses in precious metals trading, crude oil trading, financial education, and training. He's the founder and CEO of True North Asia, and director of three other private companies and ventures with a combined annual turnover of 12 million US dollars in 2013. Jonathan is also one of the youngest best-selling financial author in Malaysia with the best-selling book Why Gold, Why Silver, Why Now, which is now available in three languages. And he subsequently co-authored Keep Investing Simple and Stupid and Five Elements of Successful Investors. Jonathan is no stranger to the financial education arena in Malaysia and Singapore, having invited to speak in the largest financial and investment conferences for his knowledge and skills on alternative investments and financial education. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Hi, thanks for having me here. Yes, how are you? How is your trip to Vietnam so far this time? Vietnam has been treating me very well so far. and. One word to us, describe it would be awesome. If you can go back to the first time that you made an investment, how old were you when you made your first investment? I mean, you're very well known in Malaysia. So can you kind of walk us back uh, through to the beginning of your journey? Well, um, if you ask me, honestly speaking, I made my first investment in the financial market was around 20 years old. When I was 20, I invested into stocks. But the first asset that I first accumulated was when I was 12 years old. 12 years old? 12 years old. Now, uh, what is the concept of investments? It's really something that puts money into your pocket. So at the age of 12, back then, um, I'm not sure if you remember, there was a game called Game Boy. Game Boy. Yeah, Nintendo hmm. Game Boy. And oh, most, yes, yes. most of my friends were crazy about it. And my parents weren't very rich. They wouldn't buy such things for me. So I took out all my savings and I bought another game called Game Gear. Game Gear. So it was the addition of Game Boy with color. Uh -huh. And back then, it was a big hit. Yes. Yeah. So when I bought that, I had an idea because I have a lot of friends who couldn't afford it. And they were just like me. We weren't very rich. So I would took, take my game gear and I ran it to them. So they will rent it for me. So I was making dividends from my game every day and I actually made profits from this game. Wow, yeah. so it was your big first uh, investment, investing in this game that you could literally yeah. rent out to all those in need around you. Yeah. Do you think it was a, like a certain turning point where you said, you know, I'm, I'm just going to start investment? I mean, beyond um, your uh, interest in the investment market. Ironically, I was never a finance student. So in school, I was a computer science student. Mm -hmm. And what that really happened was there was a semester break, which I was working in a bookshop. And in that bookshop, I was the cashier. It was a part-time job. So as a cashier, I remember at that point of time, many people was buying this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Until one day, I asked one of the, uh, the customer, why are you reading this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? And he told me, if you want to be rich, young man, read this book. Yes. 
well, who who don't want to be rich here? Am I right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah? So when he said that immediately, I pick up the book, I read the book, and honestly speaking, for the first time when I read it, it was only a very good storybook. That's all. Mm. It was only the second time I read it again, and something struck my mind. That was when I was I was inspired to be an entrepreneur. I was inspired to be an investor. So that was my journey of self-learning. Yes. So I always say this, um, the school, university, those are formal education. Exactly. Formal education will teach you how to survive. But when you have self-education, that will help you to make a fortune. If I can go back now to the, that first investment um, and, and ask you this question, you know, what do you think is the foundation to having the right approach to making investment? I mean, how do you know if that investment is the right one? Uh, at this point of time, I believe if anyone were to have the interest to start learning to invest, the best investment is not stocks, the best investment is not gold and silver, and the best investment is not real estate. It's your mind. Yeah? Yes. Invest in yourself first. Because it's not stock that will make you rich. It's not real estate that will make you rich. It's not gold that will make you rich. It's what you know about stocks, what you know about gold and silver, mm. what you know about real estate. That will make you rich. So I firmly believe that when it comes to investing, there's two stage, two, two areas which you must focus on. Your mindset and your skill set. And in my humble opinion, I believe investing is 90% psychology, only 10% technical. Wow. Right? Because a lot of people can learn a lot of strategies, a lot of technical jargons, but that will not make you rich. Mm. It's really about psychology. Yes. The market is filled by fear and greed. When you're able to take control of your emotions, that's when you will start to see things differently. Exactly. Yeah. Knowledge is power and also the control of your mind, as you said, yes. and not just focus on money, money, money. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. One rich man once shared with me this. He said this. He said, Jonathan, if you want to be an entrepreneur, who should you learn from? And I said, I can attend a university to take up degree in entrepreneurship. Yes. And he said, that's the most stupid thing to do. He said, because has, has your teacher ever started a business before? Mm. If he has never started a business before... How can he have the experience? Yes, how can he have the experience to teach you about entrepreneurship? And he said, if you're going to be rich, Look at the people who you seek advice from. Uh, he shared with me, if you want to double your earnings, make sure you triple your learnings. Hmm. And that was what I started to do. I started to understand why is it that the rich are doing, how do they invest, how do they manage their money, what is really assets, what is really liabilities. And I started accumulating assets. Yes. And that was, I will say, that was the turning point in my life. It was right. education and you know having the right knowledge instead of just any knowledge in the following clip i would like to show everyone this exercise that jonathan quack has um, carried out here in the capital city of hanoi to help people have better approaches to um, investment and also to understand more about the financial challenges so let's have a look at that in the following <laughs> Beginning with zero money, these people have to earn as much money as they can within three hours. This is part of the two-day training course by Jonathan Quack in Hanoi. After a quick discussion, the team members go to different stores inside the shopping mall to persuade store owners to give them the commission from every product they successfully sell. And for people like Ming Yang, who has no experience in this and no money for now, the task is more or less impossible. Lúc mà cái bắt đầu trò chơi thì mình nghĩ rằng là mình sẽ tìm các cái cửa hàng để mình có thể là đại diện để bán hàng cho họ về những mặt hàng giá trị. Thế tuy nhiên là cái chiến lược đấy của mình nó không được thực sự thành công khi mà mình đi thử ở khoảng 7 đến 10 cửa hàng. Thế sau đấy là mình bắt đầu quay lại với đội của mình và cùng với những người bạn của mình để theo chiến lược của những người bạn của mình. Nguyễn Mạnh Linh from Group 3 is one of the first to find a job. With our money in hand, Linh believes it's better to negotiate with sellers who sell low-priced products. Also, in terms of his target customers, Linh selects children. And he is right. Hôm nay là ngày cuối tuần, nên là hầu hết các gia đình là cho bé đi chơi và họ rất là muốn tạo một cái gọi là thời gian gọi là 
rất là vui và thú vị cho có trải nghiệm cho trẻ thì là em nghĩ là họ sẽ không tiếc gì để chi trả cho một cái kẹo rất là bé này để cho bé nó vui trong ngày cuối tuần này. Some female participants try to use the skills they have developed over the years to adapt to the new environment and it seems a good choice too. Sau khi đã định vị xong và thất bại với việc là bán sức lao động thì đội tôi đành phải quay sang hình thức là bán những cái thứ mà là thế mạnh của đội đấy là kỹ năng về tư vấn, kỹ năng về sản phẩm, kỹ năng về thị trường. Đấy là những cái ưu thế nó tương đối vượt trội hơn so với cả cái sức lao động. And when the participant figure out what to do, things go rather smoothly. 50, 60, 70, 75 nghìn ạ. <laughs> From being penniless, these participants have now earned hundreds of thousands of Vietnam dong, even though they are not familiar with their new roles. People do not need money to create wealth. They need the right attitude, skills and knowledge. Also, business and investing is not a solo game, but a team sport. These are the lessons that the participants have learned from Jonathan through this game. Now, Jonathan, in the past clip, we just saw this exercise in the Big C shopping mall. Can you kind of walk us through this exercise? Well, this is a game that I want to create to solve problems that most people face. Because many people tell me this, Jonathan, I want to invest, but I don't have enough money. Is it about the money? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how many face this problem? Yes. Yes? All right. So in this game, I bring my participants. I don't care whether you're a student or you're a multi-millionaire because I understand that there was a multi-millionaire in my class. Really? Yeah, I told them to give me all their money. Yeah, not that I want their money. <laughs> I keep it, I save, keep it for them and I bring them to Big C and their job is to make money. Mm. For the past four years, I've been running this program. Um, I've been running this section of the program. So far, I've never had participants who come back without money. Yeah. Yeah. It just comes to show that if you want to do investment, it's not, it's not about the money that you have initially, it's, isn't it? My message to them is this. It does not take money to make money. What does it take? It takes ideas. It takes action. It takes network to make money. If you want to go fast, you can go alone. Mm -hmm. But if you go far, you go in a team. Because investing is not a solo sport. Investing is a team sport. It's a team sport. Yeah. It's, it's about working with others. And as we saw in the clip, um, people worked together really well in order to get that first you know, money without even starting you know, with any investment at all. Do you think that when, when a person is investing, the, one of the biggest challenge perhaps to a person being a good investor or a bad investor is themselves? Do you think, do you think a person can get into their own way? Of course. And one of the reasons why I created that game is this. Uh, usually when I organize these games, uh, ironically, it's the adults who can't make money. Youths, they can make money. Why? It's simply because adults, they have this thing called ego. Yes. And when you have ego in investing or in whatever you do, you're blinded. Hmm. All right. So one of the reasons I want to organize this game is to show those adults yeah, that when you have ego, you can't make money. So you got to let go of your ego, and from there, you, you, you be humble to learn. Thực ra mình chưa chưa làm bán lẻ bao giờ cả. Và mình cái cảm giác bán lẻ mình không có quen. Và đi chào mời từng 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 tí từng tí một thì mình thực sự là rất là khó. Và gần như mình đã vượt qua được. Và mình cảm thấy bây giờ rất là thoải mái và rất là là, là vui bởi vì tất cả mọi người cũng đều đã dành những kết quả rất là tốt. Còn những người bán đặt hàng khi mà mình bỏ cái cái tôi. Tức là mình đến và mình dám mời họ là họ dùng những sản phẩm đấy. Cái niềm tin trong những cái khóa học về tài chính và những cái chương trình làm về kinh tế, à, chúng tôi có cái cơ hội được thử nghiệm chính trong lần này. 
là chúng tôi rất là rất là hứng khởi và chúng tôi không dùng những cái chân tay bình thường và chúng tôi thử lấy cơ hội này để thử xem là cái niềm tin trong quá trình kinh doanh ở những cái đất nước giống như ở Việt Nam cái môi trường làm việc con người rồi uh, cạnh tranh ở Việt Nam thì có thừa không và chúng tôi có câu trả lời ngày hôm nay theo cá nhân của em đánh giá thì có thể là mình sẽ tận dụng những cái mặt hàng nhỏ và có thể thu được cái dòng nghĩa là có vòng quay vốn nhanh để mình uh, thu được tiền và mình có thể sử dụng để mình đầu tư vào những cái khác. Sau cái buổi ngày hôm nay thì cho thấy là mình có thể làm được kinh doanh và thậm chí là mình sẽ làm được bất kỳ công việc gì khi mà mình tin tưởng là mình có thể làm được. Và mình cần mặc dù là mình có những cái thế mạnh cá nhân tuy nhiên thì mình cần biết là tập hợp sức mạnh của đội nhóm thì thì sẽ có thể làm rất là tốt và đạt được cái hiệu quả rất là cao. Và thêm vào nữa một cái đó là mình cần phải bỏ cái tôi của mình đi thì mình mới có thể tiến được về phía trước. À, tức là cần phải cảm xúc kiểm soát được cái cả cảm xúc của bản thân. I can go back now. When did you first realize, you know, you we've been talking about money and the importance of the management of money um, in, in this game of money that we're talking about. When did you first realize the importance of money management? Well, I guess I first realized the importance of management when I was young. I was inspired by my mom. I didn't come from a rich family. My mom is an Indonesian Chinese living in Malaysia. She was in Malaysia simply because she had to seek medical assistance. Yes. And the medical cost in Singapore is too expensive. So since young, they were very prudent. And my mom always taught me to be very frugal. So I, I would say she was the one who inspired me to where I am today. And one thing that I love about her is this. Despite having no network, she can't speak English. But she worked really hard um, to build her network and to make sure I go to university. Now, when did you first make your dollar? Was it when you were 12, investing in that game gear? Not really. I made my first dollar when I was seven. Seven? Yeah. Uh, in school, we would play the flag eraser. Yes? Yeah, so when each person's eraser jumps on another person's eraser, we will take the person's eraser. Ah, yes. I'm not sure if you played it before here. Mm, I think we maybe play it with marbles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what happened was, uh, I remember it was in, I think, oh no, I was nine. So sorry. So it w it was a year which Brazil won Italy in the World Cup. Oh. So everyone was looking for the Brazil flag. So the normal eraser is only ten cents, but those rich students will offer to buy up the Brazil eraser for one dollar. Oh really? Yeah. So I was one of the poor students back then. So I. Every day after school, I will go stationary shops to stationary shops, <laughs> buying the Brazil erasers. Oh. Because it's very hard to find. So probably one shop you only can get one or two. Yeah. So that was my part-time job. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you find that one uh, Brazil, the uh, Brazilian flag um, eraser. You buy it for ten cents. You go back. You sell it for a dollar. One dollar. Yeah. And then you make a profit. I make a profit of ninety cents. That's that's yes. really cool. I still remember. That, um, Right after that, there was a cartoon called Captain Planets. Yes, I remember, remember that. Remember that? Yes. So it's about um, five young guys with a ring, yes. fire wing, trying to save the planet. Trying yeah. to save the planet. So what I did was this: I was in school, I took a, uh, I took paper, I wrapped it myself, and then I drew on it, I drew a few, and I said, "This is the latest in thing." <laughs> Uh, surprisingly, people bought it. I remember I have a friend who was sitting beside me. He's a single mother child. And he told me that he don't have money to eat food. So I hired him. <laughs> I hired him to do rings for me. Oh. <laughs> so that was my first lesson of management. And you're also your first mini business, you know, having kind of outsourcing the, the person to make the rings and then yes. you, you being the Big businessman collecting. I was doing sales. Yes. Yeah, I was a salesman and he was my admin guy. <laughs> yeah. So it was all these small things that I was doing. That's why by the time I was 12, um, I, w I could buy a Sega Game Gear by myself. Yes. Yeah. It was because my mom always taught me this save money, save money, save, save money. money. So I, I saved all this money to buy that Sega Game Gear. Yeah. But when I bought it, my mind was not to just play. My mind was. How can I make back the money that I spend? To buy it. Yeah. 
That's also kind of the difference between asset and liability, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. Can, can you explain? Can you shed, yeah. um, kind of uh, enlighten the audience on, on the difference between asset and liability and how important it is in terms of you, you know, spending money on something? All right. So let me just give you a story. Okay. Many years ago, there was a couple who just got married. So when this couple just got married, they have a house and a bit of money. So they started discussing what should we do with this money. So the couple wanted to renovate the house. They wanted to build a barn. You know what's a barn? Yeah, yeah. place where you put animals. A farm. They wanted to build a pond. They wanted to buy a car. They wanted to do so many things. So towards the end, after they do budgeting, they realized they only can choose one. And interestingly, the wife said, we should renovate the house. So why house? She said, because the house is an asset or liability? Asset, right? So the wife said, of course, if we renovate this house, the value of this house will increase. So the value of our asset will go up. But the husband said, no, we must build a barn. So they quarreled and they argued to the extent where the wife scolded the husband. What are you thinking about? Do you mean the animals are more important than me? <laughs> <laughs> now, who do you think won the argument? Husband or wife? And okay, how many of you say, honestly speaking, you feel wife? Wife. There's one or two. One or two? Husband? Okay, how many of you not raise up your hand no matter what I say? <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, if you think about it, okay, the husband actually won the argument because the husband said this, if we were to build a barn, the income generated from the animals will help us to spend and will help us to renovate the house, will help us to build a pond, will help us to buy a car. So if you think about it in this scenario, the house is not an asset. The house is a liability. Yes, wonderful. Yes. Please give him a round of applause. No. Yes. So the next time you have an argument with your boyfriend and girlfriend, future husband or wife, yes, choose the asset. Yeah? Từ đi khắp thế giới với dịch vụ chuyển vùng quốc tế của Mobifone. Let's talk more about your journey uh, of, of in this game of money. Obviously, in a game, there's always going to be, um, you know, difficulties and issues to, to tackle. Tell us about some of the challenges that you had to face, you know, running up to that first time when you were making your first investment when you were 20 and throughout this journey. Uh, the first challenge was my ego. Because when I first started investing as a student, um, interestingly, I had not much knowledge by mid money. It was simply because the market was on a bull run. Yeah. So anyone who invests, you'll make money. You were lucky. Yeah, so I was lucky. So when I went in the financial industry, I started to learn even more, um, the market crashed. So when the market crashed, I, it was ego. I couldn't take it. Yeah? But because of ego, many times it has killed me. Mm. Because I refuse to accept my mistake. So in the past, in my class, I never teach them about ego. But um, because I've made this mistake so many times, I want to make sure that my students will never repeat this mistake again. And the second thing is this, um, it's really about temptations. It's about having lifestyle. 
When I started making money, I initially I was very proud of myself. I got myself my dream sports car. Yes. I started buying more and more luxury goods. Uh, when I go out, I stopped drinking water. I started drinking wine. I, as my income increased, my expenses also increased. Mm. When it increased more, my expenses increased more. More and more liabilities. More and more. Yep. Huh? Although I still remember my mom told me this, you must be frugal. But on the other side, I tell myself, I work so hard. Yeah, I deserve this. I deserve this. Yeah. So as we move up, um, there will be some times when your investments might not make that income or your business might not make that income and your expenses is still so high. And that is when you will start to break your system. And we make such investments, you end up losing even more money. So that was when um, it taught me one thing. Strategies can change, but philosophies must, must always remain. Be consistent. Be consistent. So I took back to my, the philosophy, uh, philosophies that I believe and to bring down my expenses. Right? So today, um, I always make sure that I live on uh, compared to my income, yeah, I can afford to spend. Besides your mom, who has obviously had an influence on you from a very young age, do you have anyone else who have had an influence on you, who, who you aspire to become? Well, um, I will say that as time goes on, I, one of the things I learned was this. If you want to change your income, you will change your network, and net worth, you better change your network. Ah. And that was when I started to change the friends that I hang out with. Mm. Yeah? Because if you continue spending time with friends who talk gossip about other people, you will never be rich. But if you start to change your friends, the network who focus on the things that you want to do, who have achieved the level that you want to achieve. So it's yeah. very important uh, from whom that you, 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 know, you seek your advice, basically. Yep. And if there's one advice for all young people is this, you take out your palm, yeah, you can do it, everyone. I want you to list down who is the five people you always hang out with most of the time. Most of the time. Think. Five people. You look at all their five income, combine and divide five. Usually, is the average income that you're making. Oh. Does it make okay. any sense? Yes. Yeah? So, so the, the people who you hang out with uh, really affect the person that you aspire to become. So it's very, very important for you to be selective, not who you spend time with, but who you invest time with. Yes. Right. Who you invest your time and who you seek your advice from as yeah. well. Now, in the following report, we're going to take a look at some footages from uh, the workshop that Jonathan has held here this time in his visit to Hanoi. Um, it's on how to become more successful investors. And he was teaching a lot of Vietnamese people who are curious about that very question. So let's have a look at that in the following. During his two-day training session in Hanoi, Jonathan Quick also hosts various workshops. Through these events, he shares his knowledge on different matters, including how the international monetary and finance system works, as well as some personal anecdotes from his rich experience in business. Though many people here have already been working in the financial sector, they are still impressed by the young speaker. Trong buổi sáng ngày hôm nay thì anh Jonathan đã chia sẻ về những cái hệ thống tài chính ngân hàng, hệ thống tài chính mà điều hành cái thế giới này và liên quan đến uh, tài sản của thế giới như là vàng và và, và đồng tiền giấy. Thì em thấy thấy sự khác biệt và uh, với cái sự uh, hành động của mình để làm sao phù hợp với cả những cái thông tin này thì em cảm thấy là mình cần phải thay đổi những thói quen đầu tư để làm sao đảm bảo được cái uh, tài chính lâu dài của mình. Being an investor himself and getting involved in various fields of investment, Jonathan, despite his young age, has a lot of experience. Therefore, his opinions on setting goals, creating a timeline for investment, budgeting, and risk management all are likely to have a big impact on the participants. 
uh, chia sẻ về cái bí mật của thế giới thì không phải cái này không phải ai cũng biết mà khi mà mình biết ra được mình thấy mình vỡ lẽ ra là à từ trước đến giờ tất cả những cái gì mình tin tưởng là vào tài chính và tiền bạc và cái cách thức mình sống mình đầu tư mình giữ tiền bạc nó hoàn toàn khác những cái kiến thức mà do thằng Quyết chia sẻ thì rất là mới rất là bổ ích và những kiến thức này là rất là bổ ích cho tôi cũng như là tôi chưa chưa từng nhận được từ những diễn giả từ việt nam chúng tôi hy vọng là chúng tôi sẽ có kiến thức nhiều hơn như đã nói là kiến thức đi trước rồi sau đó là mới cái quyết định đầu tư đúng đắn còn nếu không chỉ là những cái việc chạy theo số đông mà thôi and the organizer is right to invite this young but talented speaker to vietnam khi mà jonathan quách uh, lần đầu tiên xuất hiện cùng với adam khu thật sự là đã thuyết phục chúng tôi với niềm đam mê của anh ấy với chí hướng với cách đầu tư của anh ấy thật sự là đã thuyết phục chúng tôi và thuyết phục cả những học viên tham dự lần đấy và chúng tôi hoàn toàn tự tin để mang jonathan quách về việt nam trong lần này With an annual turnover of tens of millions of US dollars, Jonathan does not work as a financial speaker for money. He only does this because he wants to share his knowledge with people so the two can benefit from it financially. Do tell us about uh, the course that you have been teaching here uh, for the past few days um, in Hanoi. What was it about? We always come together to brainstorm, to learn from each other. And I, I have my learning curve just improved so much, just because I had these amazing friends. And what happened was around one and a half years ago, someone came to me, and he said, "Can you teach me your, the secrets of your success?" And he said, "Why not? I bring students for you. You charge us money to teach us this." It, it wasn't easy for me because uh, that is not my business. No. <laughs> that is not my business model. But one thing he managed to convince me was this. He said, "Jonathan, you have been giving talks to university students. Aren't you tired?" And I said, "Why?" I said, "I love university students because university students, usually after you teach them, they are very enthusiastic. They will take action. And they are the future. And they are the future." I said, "What's wrong with that?" He said, "So what is the major frustration that you face?" And I said, "Parents." Hmm. Because usually the university students will learn something, they want to take action, and then their parents will tell them that you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And the parents, they themselves don't know what they're doing. <laughs> exactly. So this man told me this. So you should be teaching parents. As well, both ends, you know. So that struck me, and I said, okay, let's open up a program for parents. And I said, why not I open up my Wealth Insider Group to teach parents? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So that was my first program. Most of them were parents. Yeah. <laughs> and how was it? How was it initially teaching parents who has already had much experience? How, how was it challenging to kind of get past that, you know, dogma? Well, uh, I had to learn a lot about how training works, and what I was really overwhelmed because I was shocked that there are financial planners who have 30 years experience in the class. And I, I start asking this person who was making this lady who was making so much money. I say, why are you attending my class? And she said, I know how to make money, but I don't know how to protect my money. I don't know how to manage my money. I don't know how to make my money make more money. Mm. And they make a lot of sense. Let's go back to this wealth insider group here in Vietnam. Let's talk more about you know how how have they how did they react to the program? What was your interaction with the adult students here? I would say that um, the Vietnamese market is very different compared to any other markets. Any other markets is so different because the Vietnamese market is very hungry to learn. Yes. yes, aggressive. You said very aggressive. I shared this with my colleagues when I went back. They do. They didn't believe me. So this time I brought one of them here, and he told me what you say is true. Yeah. And I believe that is one of the recipe to success. Yes. Because to me, you don't need to go to school to be successful. You don't need a degree to be successful. You need a PhD. What I mean by PhD is this: first, you must have pain. Pain. Yes. You must have pain. You no. must have the pain to say that enough is enough. I'm gonna change. Two, you need a H. You need hunger. Hmm. And this is what most Vietnamese have. They have hunger. They go to the extent. Usually, my program is until six o'clock. Over here, I have to do it until 
close to 8 o'clock <laughs> because of the questions. Yes. They are so hungry for knowledge. And I love that. And D is what I call desire. Mm. The desire to succeed. The desire to go somewhere. Yes. So, so I believe... Pain, hunger and, and desire. desire. PhD. PhD. Not an actual PhD. You don't need a doctorate. You need that thing that's inside, as no. you said, 90% yeah. um, psychology. Yeah. And this is what I see a lot in my uh, Vietnamese participants, which I, that really touched me. To really, I, I don't mind coming back. So when the organizer told me, do you want to come back end of this year? I said, sure. Yeah. That's wonderful. Why gold? Why silver? Why now? Jonathan's best-selling book is available in three languages. In his book, Jonathan Briff's readers, the history of the international monetary and financial system, its evolution and inflation. He also shares his dialogues with financial experts on the importance of investing in precious metals, including gold and silver. Jonathan emphasizes that the precious metals, especially silvers, has huge potential and making investment in the metals could be very profitable. The author also predicts that more financial crisis would happen in the future and investment in gold and silver would be the way for people to avoid the possible impacts. Jonathan, in the past clip, we learned more about some of your book publications. Can you share more about these publications? I mean, when, when did you decide to kind of start uh, writing um, books and, and imparting more knowledge to a wider audience? When I was still a student, you got to remember this, I was an IT student. I was trying to learn finance. When I pick up a finance book, I will sleep because of all the financial jargons. Yeah. It's so boring. It is. It's just as good as reading a medical book. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't understand them. So it was really because of sheer hard work. Right. I, I really seek advice from people and I, and I forced myself to learn. Now, at the point of time when I was a student, I told myself this, I made a promise. If one day I can ever, ever be successful, I must remember to pay it forward. My goal was to m convert investments to fun, simple, simple Sexy. <laughs> yeah. How is investment sexy? Sim investment can be fun. It can be interesting. So if you look at a book, Keep Investment Simple and Stupid, it's designed to teach people yeah, how to invest like an idiot and trade like a pro. Yes, yeah. that's true. The one-on-one -on -one, yeah. uh, for, for investors, but in a fun and simple way rather than big jargon technical words yeah. um, that will get people probably to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, now. The second uh, of the KISS edition of the Keep Investment Simple and Stupid edition is the five elements of successful investors. What are the five elements of successful investors? All right. So we divide the elements to what we call fire, wind, water, earth, and spirit. And we realize successful investors, they have different elements. Yes. For example, I call Donald Trump a fire. Why so? Donald Trump is a person who make decisions very, very fast. Mm. He's a fire. And what's his favorite word? You're fired. Mm, yes, that's right. true. And because people who are fire, they make decisions too fast, they have very high ego, they tend to make a lot of mistakes as well. Now, um, when you look at win, win are people who are very creative. They can never sit still doing one thing. Mm. And they like to look at many different types of investments. Yes. So if I were to relate it to a real investor, um, you can look at a person like Richard Branson. Yes. Right? We don't know what he's doing because he's doing everything. <laughs> That's true. Another kind of investor is what I call a water investor. A water investor, yeah. So water investors are very people person. Mm. They like to connect with people. So they mingle well. Yes. Kind of merge into yes. the surrounding around them. They are very adaptable. Mm -hmm. So an investor, a famous one who I would relate as a water investor is a person like Peter Lynch. Before he invests in any companies, he will talk to the management. He must make sure he likes the management. Then only he will decide whether to invest or not. Another investor is called Earth. Earth, yes. Earth are people who are very meticulous, very, mm. very analytical. Yes, because like Earth, it's very still Stable. and very patient. So an example of an Earth investor is a person like Warren Buffett, analyzes a lot. Yeah? Yes. And he can wait. 
a long time before he decides to invest. So we realised that certain people are more suited to learn certain investment strategies. What was the last element, spirit? The last element is what I call spirit. Spirit is your mindset towards investing. Spirit is an element that everyone must have to do well. Exactly. Yeah? And then the other four is depending on who you are. Yes. What elements would you say that you have? I would say I'm a mixture of fire and uh, wind. Fire and wind. So you like to explore like the wind and you have the desire and passion and hunger like fire. And you make quick decisions. Yeah, I make quick decisions. And that was one of the reasons why I didn't really make much money back then. Hmm. So today when I invest, I remember I mentioned that investing is a team spot. Yes. It's not a solo game. So what I do is I, I surround myself with earth. Yes. I surround myself with people who really go at win. A lot of kind of wisdom and the patience to really think out a decision before you make it. Yep. Jonathan holds an honors degree in computer science from Coventry University, Malaysia. As an entrepreneur, Jonathan owns and runs several businesses in development, banking, precious metals trading, financial education and training. As a regular guest speaker on the conference circuit, Jonathan Quick has been invited to speak at financial institutions, corporate organizations, education institutions, both in Malaysia and internationally. Uh, aside from coaching, you also run, I believe, three companies. Can yep. you tell us more about this and kind of this balance between life and work? I still remember when I first initially made a bit of money, I wasn't very happy. And I didn't understand why. Because you probably didn't even have time. Yeah, I probably didn't have time to spend the money. And <laughs> you had a lot of money, but no time to spend it. Yeah. <laughs> and what I realized was my, my health was decreasing. I didn't really have people I can trust. And I was losing my friends. I wasn't really talking much with my parents. I was all about chasing money. I was focusing so much on financial success. Why not I also focus on life success? Hmm. So that was when I started changing my mind. So um, I started to change the way I focus on things. I focus now on life, yeah? enjoy life as it is, yeah? focus on five areas, financial health, my physical health, my mental health, social health, <coughs> and spiritual health. Yes, that's great. So in my workshop, I also teach my students this. Yes. What, what is the most important thing to you now in this period of your life? To me at this point of time, um, I actually list out these five goals, these five areas. Every area I have certain goals. Yes. And I monitor them every week. Really? Yes. Let's take an example. Uh, let's take your social health. Uh, one of the things I always make sure is this. Um, I love traveling. I love seeing different things. So every quarter, I make a point to go for holidays. When it comes to social health, I also cherish my friends. Yes. So I make a point that every month, to I meet will them take once. time to meet them. We don't talk business. I just want to spend time with them. And now, what is your biggest dream at this point? My biggest dream is to mentor more young people, young people to achieve their biggest dreams. I'm always constantly scouting for right people to bring to our team Yes. to grow bigger. Because at this point of time, we are only in Malaysia. And Malaysia itself, there's so much to do. And as we st I start to expand my territory, being invited to other countries like Vietnam, I hope that one day I can also set a presence here to set up FYI here. And I hope that this are uh, what we will be doing to expand the business, to reach out to more people. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for joining our show today. I mean, imparting your knowledge uh, to me, myself, because uh, some of the knowledge, the financial knowledge you have uh, brought to us in a very fun and um, curious way uh, that you know, has inspired me to, to be very excited about it, and I'm, as I'm sure with the audience. So thank you very much, and all of the all right. best of luck to your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you Please give him a round of applause.
And that wraps up this edition of Talk Vietnam with Jonathan Craig. I'm sure uh, you have been inspired as well uh, to perhaps, you know, start learning more knowledge about the world of finance, the world of investment, but also make changes in your life, even if you are not interested in the business world, to, to be better and to um, basically achieve big and dare to dream big as well. So thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you more next time here in Talk Vietnam. Goodbye.